uh, I think we are ready and uh, I can start. So this is the QR code for the uh, virtual env uh, environment that I created for you. The first, I don't know, maybe 200 people can uh, join the session uh, with this uh, QR code. Uh, it's also posted on the virtual platform, so uh, you can also find it there and uh, you can also find that as a link format. So let's uh, start the workshop. This will be a serum workshop uh, and my name is Christian Fekete. I'm currently working at Solo as a field engineer uh, and you can see my uh, Twitter handle and email address uh, on this slide. What is Cilium? Cilium is basically an open source software and it can help you to transparently secure your network connectivity in your, in your Kubernetes cluster. Um, most of the cases it's used as a CNI and it's a um, quite popular choice uh, in Kubernetes uh, clusters. Cilium at its foundation is using uh, a new technology, a somewhat new technology called eBPF and uh, that can help to uh, have a better performance at this low kernel level uh, logic uh, without recompiling uh, your uh, Linux kernel itself. We will take a detailed look at uh, what the eBPF is at the beginning of the presentation. On top of that, Cilium uh, creates uh, security policies and you can apply those uh, without any changes to the actual application code and you can use uh, these network policies to have a multi-layered uh, security uh, posture over your applications. So let's first start with uh, eBPF. What is it and uh, what it's good for? Uh, basically, uh, back in the day there were BPF and if you, ha if you, uh, if you have already used, uh, for example, TCP dump, then uh, it's possible that you use BPF uh, without even knowing it. eBPF is the uh, most recent rendition of this technology. It provides a flexible, safe and fast way to inject custom logic into your kernel uh, in a flexible, safe and fast way. Flexible because you don't need to recompile your uh, actual kernel. Safe because uh, there's a verifier uh, in the pipeline. So only uh, verified BPF code can run into your run in your kernel, and uh, this is uh, this is a pretty good uh, way to uh, to have safe code deployed uh, there. And it's uh, actually quite fast because uh, it's just in time and compiled. Uh, at, uh, at native uh, speed. There are multiple use cases for eBPF. First, there's security. You can, uh, you can check actual uh, syscalls happening in your system and uh, implement and trigger custom uh, logic uh, when these uh, syscalls are happening. You can use the same for uh, file reads, file opens, uh, and uh, other uh, system calls as well. Then eBPF can be used for tracing and profi uh, profiling. Yeah, you can have details, detailed um, profiling information uh, with eBPF, for example. There are projects uh, utilizing, utilizing uh, eBPF to uh, profile your, uh, your code without uh, touching the code itself. Then there are networking uh, use cases. Cilium is, using, uh, is um, targeting these uh, network use cases uh, at some extent. And observability and monitoring is the last uh, larger uh, family of eBPF use cases. Cilium also can help with observability and monitoring. You can have matrix histograms, you can log events uh, that are happening at certain kernel probes, and uh, you can expose these from kernel space and access them in user space. Uh, that's the high-level architecture of eBPF. You can see that uh, there's a kernel runtime running at the bottom uh, section. That layer has the actual verif uh, verifier and compiler. Uh, there are maps. These maps are basically the uh, corridors between user space and kernel space and you can put data in, in kernel space and, uh, and take uh, these data and the, 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 out the output uh, out in, in user space. And uh, there are, there are many uh, kernel helper APIs available as well to make your uh, life easier when you are developing eBPF code. 
Then in the user pay, uh, space, there are multiple projects that can help you. For example, BCC, uh, there are uh, SDKs to make, uh, for example, programming in Go uh, easier. There's uh, libbpf, for example. So the ecosystem is uh, growing bigger and bigger every day. And there are uh, a few eBPF projects also out there, for example, Falco, that's security related. Uh, there's Cilium, uh, focusing on networking and, uh, and uh, observability. And uh, there are other uh, solutions as well. Basically, this is how the user space and kernel space uh, interact uh, with each other. In uh, user space, you can uh, First, you have a task in user space, and uh, there you will need to handle the whole lifecycle of uh, of the of the uh, BPF code itself. You have to load it, attach it to probes, and uh, destroy it when your uh, job is finished. And in the kernel, you have the uh, verifier I mentioned already, and you also have these K probes, U probes, trace, uh, trace points. These are the points in the kernel when you can uh, where you can. Uh, create a trigger to attach uh, custom logic uh, to it. And there's uh, the maps, which are, as I mentioned, basically the uh, corridor for you to uh, move data between these two uh, spaces. Originally, uh, what you would normally do, would, uh, uh, you would use uh, BCC to create uh, your BPF programs. Basically, in this case, you are writing a single Python program and you are injecting the BPF logic as a string. And uh, you also have uh, the kernel program that's written in C. Everything is compiled at runtime, but uh, it requires uh, you to have the actual kernel headers installed on the system when you are uh, building this uh, logic. Uh, another drawback of this traditional approach is that it will use a significant amount of resources when you are starting this program. Then there's a, a newer rendition to this. It's called Cori, means compile one uh, once, run everywhere. It's using libpf, and uh, basically with this approach, you can write both kernel and user space in C, and you can uh, compile them in advance. If you have uh, the proper uh, headers at, at, uh, at runtime, you could uh, execute it uh, on any other system because uh, you are following the Cori uh, principles. Uh, what uh, we did at Solo is we tried to make this uh, a bit easier. So what if you could only write the kernel program and forget about the user space logic? For this, we introduced uh, Bumblebee, which is an open source, uh, source project. It helps you to uh, focus only on the kernel space logic, build your custom BPF scripts into OCI-compatible images, push these into local or remote registries, and uh, expose the outputs as metrics. So as you can see, the uh, barrier to entry is, is quite low because you don't need to manage the whole lifecycle of your code. You just uh, create your uh, kernel logic, that's the uh, most exciting uh, part anyway, and uh, load it as, a, as an OCI image uh, into kernel and you already have primitives metrics, which is quite nice. So after the eBPF introduction, let's uh, move forward and uh, start talking about uh, Cilium. On this slide, you can see the sort of the evolution of uh, QProxy uh, replacement options. First, initially, um, in a traditional Kubernetes cluster, you have a QProxy and it's using uh, IP tables. IP tables were not really meant for this job. It's, it was a great firewall, but there are some performance bottlenecks but uh, when you, when you uh, scaled your cluster out. Uh, in some CNIs, there's an option to use IPVS, which can uh, make your life a bit easier in terms of performance, because, because you can, uh, uh, you can um, reach much nicer run trip times, and uh, you will know how you can scale your clusters and how, how the performance will actually scale with, with your cluster size. And the uh, most recent rendition is uh, using EPPF for, uh, for some of the tasks. And uh, we will take a look at how Cilium uh, is doing this. So let's start the actual lab. We will go 
back to this presentation at some point in the during the workshop, but uh, now we are starting the the actual uh, uh, lab. So I guess you have it up and running. As I mentioned, we have 200 licenses for this. After you click start, you can click launch and uh, I will zoom in a bit. Hopefully it will be, uh, you can read it on, on the screen as well. What is happening in the background is that uh, we are using this uh, platform called Instruct. Uh, in this Instruct environment, we are uh, building a three node Kubernetes cluster, and we will use this cluster to deploy uh, Cilium, and we will interact Cilium uh, through this uh, environment. Yes, of course. This is the QR code. This session will be av available, uh, this environment will be available until tomorrow afternoon-ish. So if you, are, if you just want to focus on the actual workshop, you can do that. And if you have this link uh, with this QR code, you can, uh, you can try this at, at home uh, or, or afternoon or tomorrow morning as well. Okay, and I have the environment ready. First, we will deploy Cilium. Uh, let's zoom in a bit. Hopefully it won't break the, the actual interface. Okay, so the first step that we, that we will do is to uh, deploy, uh, to install uh, Cilium CLI. The first command will do that. You can click on it and paste on it on the, on the other, uh, other uh, terminal uh, window. After we have it, you can check Cilium and okay, we have the CLI. Let's check the pods that we have running in this cluster. kubectl get pods. And we can see that all these pods are in a pending state. If we check the uh, details of these pods, kubectl describe the name of the pod cube system. Yes, uh, it's pod. We will see that the nodes are not uh, available and we have some taint on it. Let's check the actual nodes that we have. As I mentioned, we are running a three uh, node cluster. The nodes are, are not ready. If we describe the nodes, kubectl describe nodes, for example, master, we will see that it's not really ready. Uh, the kubelet is, is almost started. And if we scroll up a bit, we will see that Kubelet is actually not ready because the network plugin is not ready. And the network plugin is not ready because the CNI plugin is not initialized. We just deployed, we just installed the Cilium CLI, but we don't have an actual CNI running on these clusters, and that makes our nodes unavailable. So let's uh, fix this and uh, deploy Cilium. We are using the upstream uh, Cilium help, help repository and we are using uh, this latest uh, version. It's 1.12.1. As you can see, we are passing a few uh, arguments to this Helm install. Uh, we will go with uh, partial queue proxy replacement and uh, we are also configuring a few options here. We will go through these uh, uh, in a bit. So let's uh, hit enter and the Helm installation is currently happening. Partial queue proxy replacement means that uh, you can uh, cherry pick which uh, features of the queue proxy you want to replace. We are using uh, partial in this example, but there are other options as well. Uh, the Cilium uh, docs uh, has some detailed 
explanation about the different modes. It's quite detailed and it's a pretty good documentation if you want to uh, go into the details of the, of the uh, various options that you can have here. Okay, let's uh, check our pods again and we can see that all of them is running, which is great. We have a CLI. After this, we can use Cilium status and uh, this will show us a little nice graphics and, we, and it will report back that Cilium and the operator itself is uh, running and are in the OCK state. We also have could have Hubble and Cluster Mesh. Cluster Mesh is for uh, multi-clusters and Hubble is an observability uh, component. We have these disabled at the moment, but we will deploy it uh, at, a, at a future uh, lab. As you could see, that's all the information that you can have regarding the Cilium uh, uh, that you have in your cluster. However, uh, you can have a more verbose Cilium uh, uh, CLI. For this, you can use the next command, which is basically uh, executing the same command, Cilium status, but it passes the verbose option and you can have much more, uh, de uh, much more details about your actual uh, installment. We can also do that, uh, we can also check the actual CLI that we have locally in this, uh, in this uh, computer, uh, but uh, it won't have this verbose option. It's an unknown flag. But let's execute this command and we have pretty detailed uh, configuration options here. We can see that Cilium is okay. These are reported by the CLI itself. We can check the allocated addresses. We have the control status for all the components. We have all of them in a healthy uh, state. And uh, we can also find details about the Q proxy rep uh, replacement. These are the config options that were uh, that we specified when we passed uh, those uh, set options to our Helm installation. Okay, let's move forward to the next lab, because in this lab we just deployed uh, Cilium and uh, basically that's it. If you are ready, we can click check. This in the background will uh, check the, all the previous steps that I just uh, performed and if uh, everything is fine, we can move to the next lab. In the next lab, we will deploy the famous BookInfo demo application. You might have already uh, know about this application if you used uh, Istio. Okay, if you are not really familiar with BookInfo, let's take a quick look at what BookInfo is. It's basically a demo application. Uh, it contains multiple microservices. For example, we have the product page. Product page is our front end. We will uh, interact with this uh, front end and uh, this front end will interact with the other microservices. We have three Java services. It's called uh, Reviews version 1, version 2 and version 3. The only difference between these versions is the uh, is the is the color of the of the stars that you can that you will see at uh, you can see for for each books uh, that uh, included in the in the platform. Version two has black stars and version three has uh, red stars and version one uh, has no stars at all. These Java services are also connected to an OGS service. Uh, it's called ratings. Uh, as you can see. The ratings are uh, important for the cases when you have the stars because the, that's, the, that's the actual rating. And we also have a detail service that's uh, written in Ruby. So let's deploy this uh, set of uh, microservices. We are creating a new namespace. It's called BookInfo and we are applying uh, these uh, YAML files. We will also access uh, this uh, product page uh, ourselves. So we will need to patch the actual service and uh, set its uh, type to load balancer. Originally it's cluster IP, so you cannot access it. But if you patch it with this config option, it will be a load balanced, uh, mm, it will have a load balanced address. And if you go to this tab called BookInfo, you will see the actual BookInfo application. An important thing to mention is you should always use this refresh button during the workshop. This will re uh, reload, refresh your actual uh, 
tab that you have here. Please do not use this because that will reload Instruct itself and you will have to uh, start from, well, not the beginning, but it's, it's, uh, it's better to use uh, this because that's, uh, that's really for this purpose to refresh the actual web page. We have uh, Blackstars currently, so that's version two. You can also uh, check this uh, update at the, at the bottom. Okay, if we are ready, we can also uh, we can uh, hit check and go to the uh, second, uh, the third uh, lab. Across these labs, we are still using the same uh, same uh, environment that we initially created. So we just deployed uh, the Cilium CNI and we just deployed an application. The next section will be about load balancing. That's one of the use cases that uh, Cilium can help with. So let's take a look at this. First, let's check the uh, reviews service. As you can see, it's a cluster IP, it's called reviews. It has actually a cluster IP and uh, it's using uh, this port. Now let's take a look at the review spots. We can see three different uh, pots, version one, version two, and version three. And these are the IPs of these pots. Uh, behind the scenes, this cluster IP is being load balanced across these IPs. This is how Kubernetes networking uh, is working uh, by default under the hood. Normally, QProxy uh, is taking care of these, but uh, you can also have Cilium to, to help you with load balancing uh, across ports and services. So let's run the next uh, command and check uh, the Cilium uh, load balancing list. As you can see, we are again using the Cilium pod and using that CLI. Uh, we have these options, Cilium BPF, then LB. LB means uh, load balancing. That's the load balancing configuration. And I also passed list to check the actual uh, addresses that it's load balanced, uh, that it's uh, performing load balance. If we go back a bit, we can see that that was the actual cluster IP of our uh, service. And these are the actual IPs of the pods, basically, in Cilium, you have the service address and you have all these backend uh, addresses uh, attached to it. Let's take a look at our nodes. If you pass the wide option, you will see the actual internal IP of, uh, of each of your uh, nodes. And uh, if we execute the next command again, we can list all the BPF tunnels. It's similar than before, but now we are not listing the load balancing configuration, but the tunnels. Currently, the, in, this, in this setup, we are on the master. This is the actual master node, and uh, we have the worker one and worker two machines. If you are on the actual master machine and you uh, query the tunnel list, you will see that you have tunnel to the other, uh, other nodes in your Kubernetes cluster. So uh, you can see that 67 is the actual master and we have 69 and 66 here because that's needed for internode communication. If we finish everything, we can click next again and move to the uh, next session. This will be about main concepts. For this, let me quickly jump back to the presentation for a side a slide or two. One of the main concepts that uh, we will introduce here are endpoints and identities. Uh, if you're using Cilium, you have a single endpoint per Kubernetes pods. 
and you also have an identity ID for all of your uh, for all of your endpoints. And this identity ID is derived from your actual Kubernetes labels that you have on your pods. You can find some examples on the on the slide, but basically the labels will decide the identity of your uh, of your uh, entity. If you have two pods in a single deployment, for example, if you are scaling out horizontally your application, then it will generate two endpoints, but the identity ID will remain the same. That's uh, a quite elegant way to solve this, because as you may have already know, the actual pod names in your Kubernetes cluster are not that important, are not that unique. Actually, they are unique, but they can contain random characters as well. And uh, labels provide a very nice way and nice and elegant, elegant way to, uh, to annotate your actual uh, workload. So using, using uh, labels is, is, a, is a very nice solution for this purpose. You can also check this uh, serum documentation here about the terminology. It has some other uh, concepts introduced as well, but here we are just talking about the endpoints and identities because these will be important for the uh, next few labs that we will have here. So let's go back to the actual, uh, actual lab. If we execute the first command, that will scale our details version one uh, deployment to two replicas. By default, all the book info applications are uh, running with a single, single replica. In, uh, in the real world, you must probably have uh, deployments running with multiple replica to have high availability. So now that we have the details version one scaled to two pods, we can, check, we can check the serial endpoints uh, in the book info namespace. As you can see, book info is the namespace that has our application. If we search for uh, details version one, we will see that we have a pod here and details version one is the first one. So we have these two different pods. And if you check the identity ID, you can see that it's the same. It's two, four, one, and 89. We also have these SVCLB uh, identities uh, endpoints here. You don't need to uh, care about them. Those are just those are just there because uh, behind the scene, those are used to port forward these applications uh, in Instruct. So if this uh, workshop uh, weren't running on Instruct, you would have you would only have the reviews, product page, and details applications. Uh, these are only needed for this particular environment. So back to the identity ID. As you can see, these are the same, but you have two different pods. We can scale it down to a single replica, and we can check the product page endpoint. Product page is our front end, as I mentioned uh, earlier. You can, we can use the Cilium endpoints, that's a Kubernetes CRD, uh, so you can uh, actually interact with your uh, Cilium uh, through these CRDs. If you use this and you, uh, are filtering, you filter for your uh, product page application, then you can have all these details about your uh, Cilium endpoint. As you can see, it's called product page, that's the actual application. You have the ID here, you have the identity ID here. And this identity, as I mentioned, is created from all these labels that you would have uh, for your actual application. You can check the other uh, identities in your cluster. You can do something like kubectl get Cilium identities. We also have autocomplete, so you don't need to type this out. You can just tab and uh, execute the, the actual command. These are all the identities that we have in, the, in, in our current cluster. We can see that we have three in the cube system namespace and a few more in the book info because we have multiple versions of, uh, of certain services running. Okay. We can also get uh, these 
labels and details about the identity uh, by checking each and every one of these uh, by the actual identity. So we can do something like kubectl get psyllium identity and if you use one of the uh, IDs and choose YAML, you can get the same uh, set of data. So basically you will see the uh, labels that, that made, uh, that created this entity. We can click next after we finish this. The next part will be observability. For this, I have a slide, single one again. Observability in Cilium is uh, basically done with Hubble. Hubble contains multiple components. Uh, we have the Hubble UI, that's the actual UI that you can see on this slide. And we also have relay components, we will talk about uh, them uh, in a bit. Hubble is created to give you detailed insight into the actual state of the cluster you have Cilium running on. Uh, and uh, we will ch uh, check uh, exactly this in the uh, next lab. So let's go back to the authority lab. As I mentioned, we are still running the same environment, the same nodes, the same uh, ports everywhere uh, when we started. So to en enable uh, Hubble, we will need to upgrade the uh, Cilium installation that we have. We can run Cilium status again, and we will see that Hubble is disabled. To enable it, uh, you can use the next snippet. We have a few things there, but basically we are just upgrading the existing uh, Cilium, which is using the upstream Cilium time chart with the same version. And the important thing here is that we, are, we enable the metrics for DNS, uh, drop packages, TCP, flows, ICMP, and HTTP. You can uh, fine tune this list if you are not in interested in all of these uh, when, you, when you enable Hubble. Additionally, we are enabling the relay component and the Hubble UI and Prometheus. Let's hit enter and uh, perform this upgrade. If we check the ports in the cube system, Cilium is always in the cube system namespace. Ha, actually, that's an interesting uh, issue that uh, we just discovered. Originally, we created this workshop with, with, uh, with one of the RC version of, uh, of Cilium. But uh, last week, at the end of last week, we upgraded, the, upgraded it to the, uh, to the latest uh, proper release. But uh, in, we, with this version in this instruct environment, uh, we can get to the state. It seems like almost a race condition in um, Cilium itself. We don't have these uh, Hubble pots coming up, which is weird because we have the actual Cilium pots running. So to, I'm not, I'm not sure, maybe some of you have this uh, on your local laptop as well. Yes, we have at least. Uh, one uh, place where we got this. To work around this, we can uh, delete the ports in the cube, cube system namespace, and uh, that will fix the issue. So we can do something like kubectl delete ports uh, cube system. And maybe that should be it. We can pass the all. Okay. These will be deleted. We are using a fairly new version, so we will uh, probably look into this and uh, open a GitHub issue and maybe even try to solve this uh, because we didn't have this with the, with the uh, latest RC version. The ports should be deleted soon. I should have my prompt back after it's finished. Come on. Hmm. 
maybe I can uh, terminate this command and we will be fine. kubectl get all cube system. Okay, the ports are still terminating and some of them are in the container creating state. It will work, I promise. We can use watch to watch these get pots cube system. How many of you uh, got this in your local uh, laptop? Yes, One, two, three. Okay, three at least three. Okay, I have another workaround because it looks like it's uh, it's not working because oh maybe it's working. No. Container creating. Okay, so the other workaround that we can do is to use skip. Please only skip uh, if you are stuck with the same state that I'm in. Uh, I'm in. All the other attendees can, uh, can wait a tiny bit. If you click skip, uh, instruct in the background will resolve the state. And uh, after that, we can uh, go back to this lab and, uh, and actually finish, finish it. Ah, okay. So if we change namespace to cube system and we run the command again, uh, it should work. So if you uh, haven't clicked uh, skip yet, that's also a, a very uh, nice way to get unstuck. Thank you for, uh, for the information. If you already skip, uh, clicked skip, then uh, please follow me. We can go start, then we can close this. If you close this, you can jump back to observability. And if we are back to observability, we can, you can, we can list the pots in a cube system. Do we have the pots coming up? Okay, okay. We have them up and running. And now I think I can perform the actual upgrade. Hopefully it will work, it, it should work. So we can... Uh... Yes, it worked. We have the Hubble Relay and the Hubble UI up and running. So. Uh, sorry about this little incident. Uh, we can forward. We can move forward with the with the workshop. So now we basically we just upgraded uh, Cilium uh, in the cluster, and now we have the Hubble components uh, enabled. We will use the same method that we used earlier to patch the service of the Hubble UI. That's needed because we will we will uh, access the actual UI. So execute the next command, uh, which will patch the service to the load balancer type. And if you go to the Hubble UI, you should see the, uh, the actual UI. After a little while, you will see all the namespaces in your cluster. You will see book info, you will see uh, the, the queue system namespace, all of them will be here. We just need to wait a very little bit because, again, uh, because of Instruct. By itself, Cilium uh, gets these uh, pretty fast. What we will do after this is we will generate a small load in the cluster and we will uh, check uh, this load that we generated across the various components that we have in the cluster uh, through the Hubble UI. This shouldn't take more than uh, maybe one more minute.
you will also have the, you will have all the namespaces reset here, and the they will be also reset here. And yes, I I have all the ports up and running, so I just checked that everything is working for, uh, properly now. In the meantime, if you have questions, then please feel free to ask those questions. While we are waiting, we can take a look at the uh, load generator script that, <laughs> that we have here. It's basically a for uh, loop. It will uh, create 25 requests and uh, it's basically a curl and we will uh, uh, route these requests to the load balance port of uh, product page on this port. Okay, come on. Sorry? Yes, it's. Uh, we are not waiting because of the, because we are waiting to uh, check the load itself. We haven't run, ran this uh, script. We are just waiting because in this particular instruct environment, it takes a little time for Hubble to to get all these uh, data. But yes, you are right. If you would, uh, were just waiting for the actual. Uh, traffic that we generated, then we should have queue system there. So after uh, it's ready, you should see something, something like this. You could see uh, flows per second. You should see the number of the nodes that you have and your actual namespaces. So if you choose book info, we will see the content of book info. So this is a good uh, time to run this uh, script. We can go back to the first terminal and run this for loop. As you can see, these are the successful 200 response code requests that uh, we generated. And if we refresh, uh, there are some mosquito here. And we sh if we check the actual load, we will see that the product page, which is our front end, that, that was the one that uh, got our request. Uh, has other requests spanning out to the uh, multiple review services and some of the review services uh, reached out to the details, um, detail services. You can see all these data here. Uh, let me quickly zoom a bit closer. You should see the source service, the, de the destination service, the destination port uh, of the, uh, during the communication. Uh, we don't have L7 uh, info here for layer uh, layer 7. So this is basically a very nice way to quickly check the actual state of your cluster. Uh, these data are not, uh, uh, this data is not uh, persisted, so you, you can just use this to uh, check the, the actual state of, of your system that you have here. How you can get this data with, with the Hubble UI? The actual server part of uh, Hubble is embedded into the uh, Cilium agent. The Cilium agent is running as a daemon set on every Kubernetes node that you have, and it's exposing all these metrics uh, to, through gRPC. We can actually use uh, gRP curl to, to check uh, how, how this uh, looks like. But basically, uh, this is where the relay component comes into picture. Because as I mentioned, the Cilium agent is exposing all these metrics. It's running as a daemon set everywhere. And because you have a distributed system running on multiple nodes, uh, you need a relay component 
to consolidate all these into a single place to make easier uh, for the uh, UI to expose all this data, to visualize all this data. So if you execute the next uh, command, as you can see, it's uh, the GRP curl image, and we will uh, uh, target this uh, particular path. It's called get flows. It will actually get all the flows that you currently have in your system. It, it will run for a while because there are many, communica there are many communication happening uh, in this given moment, but basically in this uh, format it's, uh, it's exposed as, as, as gRPC. You can see the type of the connection, you can actually check the name of the nodes, um, you have timestamp uh, there, so basically that, that's uh, what's, uh, what's uh, behind uh, all this uh, Hubble visualization. You could also check all these by running the next command. Be, uh, that will use the Cilium CLI again. It's, uh, now you, it will use the monitor uh, uh, subcommand. And that's basically the same sets of data. We just uh, not accessing the raw uh, gRPC interface. That's the CLI. So we have some. Uh, it's, it's a nicer way to visualize all this data, but it's again, it's the same uh, sets of data that's being visualized on the Hubble UI. What we could also do is uh, that we can uh, deploy a Prometheus. You can use the next command to do that. And uh, if you have Prometheus exposed, we will have it exposed if we patch the service again to load balancer. We did this many times before. And if you check Grafana and check the dashboards, you should see, for example, the Hubble dashboard. And if you narrow it down and zoom in a bit, you can see the actual uh, data visualized as Prometheus metrics through Grafana. This is for Hubble. It can uh, track the actual flows per uh, node, the distribution of the traces, and uh, it also has a few other components. For example, Cilium operator. We don't need to save this. And uh, this also exposes a few uh, useful uh, metrics about the actual operator. For example, we can see the CPU usage. And, uh, these are basically exposed as native Cilium metrics, which is quite nice because otherwise without this, you would need to have, for example, a node exporter to get the, get the same uh, data. And that's, uh, that's an external dependency. So it's quite nice to expose uh, the resource usage metrics uh, this way. Uh, if you were stuck with me with the previous step and you follow my uh, uh, workaround, then uh, at this uh, state you wouldn't have the check button here. You only have the, the skip one. Uh, that's because if we skip to the to a lab, we cannot redo it. You we can just uh, view it, but we cannot actually skip uh, again from it. So if you followed me, uh, then uh, click close. And if you didn't have an issue, then please uh, click check and you can follow the uh, workshop that way. So I will close this and we can move to, to the security uh, lab, which is the next one. response times or the like amount of traffic that's, that's happening between them? Or is there anything that uh, is not possible in Cilium here, which is for the Cilium Enterprise or something like that? Can you say something about this? Yes, that's uh, basically you can get uh, latency metrics as well with, uh, with Cilium. You can get these uh, with uh, EBPF. 
another way to get this is uh, using uh, layer 7 components, for example, service mesh, and uh, you can have all these data. But are they being displayed in the humble UI? Yes, the layer seven metrics are part of the Cilium Enterprise package. Okay. We are we are just using the open source version here to uh, showcase the power of the open source version. Thanks. Okay, sorry, I didn't get the <laughs> actual question. Yeah, this still does provide what you were asking. Yeah, but Cilium open source, I don't think it is. Yes. With Kiali, you are basically just leveraging the Prometheus metrics behind the scenes. So you have to have a Prometheus, yeah. and uh, Kiali is just there to visualize all this in a, in a nice way. It's basically like Hubble for right. Istio. We can, we can sort, some, sort of say that. OK, the next lab is about uh, level 3 and level 4 security. And uh, this is one of the greatest benefits of uh, using eBPF-based uh, CNI, like uh, Cilium, to have multi-layered security uh, in your Azure cluster. We will take a look at uh, different level 3 and level 4 uh, policies here. And in the next lab, we will uh, check uh, layer 7 and uh, we can uh, compare them, what's the benefit, what's different with uh, using these uh, different policies. Again, I have a link to the upstream uh, Cilium documentation. Uh, there are many examples here. Basically, uh, we can see label-based approaches. Uh, we have uh, some examples, actually ML files that you can execute for uh, simple use cases. For example, if you just want to, let me quickly zoom a bit. If you just want to allow communication from the uh, endpoints of uh, of the front end uh, to the actual back end, you can do something like this. And this is layer three because we didn't even specify the actual uh, port here. Uh, let me quickly go back to my presentation. I think I should have, uh, or maybe I don't have it. If I don't have it, I can quickly Yes, the OCI layers. Some of you may have already know about this, but let me quickly. Wow. Yes, so we have the physical layer at the bottom, then we have the data link layer, and uh, if we go up, we will reach the application layer. Application layer is layer seven. That's where the actual uh, actual uh, application facing requests are happening, and uh, layer three and layer four are there for transmission. The actual uh, transmission of the packages using TCP and UDP, and uh, at, at layer four we can we can actually use the the ports to uh, route our traffic. So if we go back to our lab, we can check these examples uh, in action. So let's use this first snippet. That will be a layer four policy. Uh, we, can, we know that it's layer four because we have the port here. Without this, uh, if you don't specify the port, you can just uh, uh, limit the connection between the two services. And as the documentation, uh, mentions it's, it's uh, label based. So you can use these match labels that you are most probably already familiar uh, from Kubernetes and, uh, and limit, the, limit the actual uh, or set up the actual policy there. But here we are also defining the, the port and the protocol. Let's uh, apply this. And at this point, if we try to run the next command, which will again occur call and uh, that will call the review service, if you execute it, you actually won't see anything happening. 
and uh, that's because we are at layer four and there's no real convenient way to report back that why it's failed. We are basically dropping the packages. So it's, it's the expected result currently to, to see these, but you don't see any, uh, don't see any feedback of, uh, of what happened. So if you are not familiar with what's happening behind the scene, it might be a bit hard to troubleshoot uh, this uh, particular uh, case. Uh, but if you run the next command, in the next terminal, we have two terminals. Then uh, this will call the CDO monitor subcommand, and it will uh, we we edit this uh, type. It's it's uh, type drop. So when we have a dropped uh, packet, uh, we should uh, able to catch this with this terminal. So if we go back to terminal one and execute this uh, request command again, we should see that in the in terminal two that we have an info level message, it's xx drop policy denied, uh -huh, because we have a policy denied and we can also see that this is the end, end point that uh, got this request. We also can see that uh, identity 2419 uh, had uh, uh, a request to identity 8972. You can also have the IP addresses and it was a TCP uh, scene. Uh, it was in the, in the scene phase. So actually with this you can uh, check where the, where the packets being dropped. And we have a few other communication happening in the background. So if you, if you uh, leave it like this, uh, you can see some uh, more uh, connections or packets uh, being dropped. If you want to check the actual identity of, uh, let's take this first because I know it's, it's my, my identity. So let's, let's uh, copy this. You will have a different identity in your laptop, but uh, I'm using this first one. And we can execute the second command, the next command, but uh, replace it with our desired identity. It's the Cilium identity get. You could also get the same with uh, using, the C, uh, using the CRD that we did earlier. 2419, in my case, 2419. And I made a mistake, 2419. Maybe that was a connection that was not related to... Oh yeah, th there's, uh, there's an eight, yes. And yes, we have it. It's the details uh, application. Great. This is where we originated our request. Thank you. Uh, as I mentioned, you could also use the Cilium CRDs. So here we use the Cilium CNI, CLI running in, a, in the pod, but you can also use these Cilium endpoints and Cilium identities uh, if you prefer that way of interacting with your Kubernetes resources. Uh, if you think that getting a 403 response code would be much better in this case, uh, then uh, we can uh, see what uh, the level seven policies can uh, offer us to, to have. So let's click next and go to the final lab. Okay, so in this lab, we will uh, take a look at how Cilium uh, handles the level seven network policies, because it might not be what but you would uh, expect uh, by yourself originally. So let's uh, first uh, run the first command. That's a quite long uh, command that will list uh, the processes that is currently running in the Cilium ports. Uh, you can see that we have 
we got this two times because it's running on two different uh, nodes in the system. We can see that we have the psyllium agent, that's the actual psyllium agent, and we have the psyllium health responder, which is basically just there to uh, report back uh, based on the health of the actual components. Uh, so let's apply another policy, but this time a layer 7 policy. This is the policy that we will apply. As you will see, it's layer 7 because we are specifying path and HTTP rules. If we, if we uh, didn't specify this and just use the port and protocol, then that's layer uh, 4. And if we didn't specify the uh, actual uh, protocol and port, and just, the, uh, just uh, reference the services based on labels, then that would be layer 3, as I mentioned earlier. But with this layer 7 example, it's quite nice to peel it back and uh, check uh, what makes it level, layer 7 or, or layer uh, 4. So let's apply this policy. We have it applied. And uh, let's uh, run the comment again that we ran uh, initially. The uh, output here is a bit different because we can see that we have a Cilium Envoy uh, process running. And uh, that's running there because Envoy is needed to enforce the layer 7 policies. Envoy is basically, Envoy can have a filter chain. If you are familiar with Envoy, you may have already know that uh, you can have a filter chain and you can use this to, to get all these uh, enforced quite elegantly. Uh, if uh, we execute the next command, in this case, we should get a 403 because that's layer, uh, layer 7. And on layer 7, you are at that level on the OCI layers that you can get a, a, re a response like this. The interesting thing to mention here if we take a look at the actual uh, network policy that we applied, we had to create this fake rule here. It's called no pass allowed. That's currently needed because uh, in Cilium, there's no real support for deny policies at layer seven. Uh, you can actually check the documentation and you can have these at uh, lower layers. But at layer 7, you, you don't uh, really uh, have this. Deny policies are just on layer 4 and uh, layer 3. So you can work this around by creating a rule like this to, to have denies, but uh, it's not natively supported currently. We can run the next snippet. It's not even a comment. We can call it a snippet because it's quite huge, but it will, and it will take a bit uh, before it uh, it can actually run because it it will need to download a few packages. But with uh, with this snippet, we can uh, take a look into the layer seven policy uh, under the hood, how the filter chains are. Uh, uh, put together in this example. <coughs> if you are impatient, you can scroll a bit down and uh, have the spoiler <laughs> for the for the actual output, but uh, it shouldn't take long. And in the meantime, I'm being messaged on the tab where I, when I open the uh, OCI model. Maybe there's some bot there, so I think I will close that. Uh, close that tab. So Christian, while we are waiting, can you talk about how the identity is derived? Um, and so yeah, based on the IP and 
and what's the recommendation for the internal calling? Uh, you mean the recommendation for? Like the, the network hash based identity is not always accurate. You know the stuff we were doing? So basically the, the identity was derived on pod IP. Yes. And then in Kubernetes environment, when pods go up and down easily, the identity could be mistaken? Yes. Because it's, as I mentioned, it's it's an elegant way to leverage the labels for uh, for identity, but there might be cases when you have, for example, you have a fresh deploy uh, for your uh, application and you have new pods coming up, and uh, there might be edge cases when the identity can be mistaken because uh, it's it's only based on the actual labels and it's not uh, performed by. Uh, uh, by a solution that can uh, avoid to make this happen. So that's, that's uh, an edge case that uh, it, it might be good to, to know about if you, if you run it uh, in production. Okay, I think um, I might, uh, maybe there's something with my connection. Has the command run for you? Yeah, okay, so it maybe it's it's just my case, but basically we can use this snippet here and check how the policies are uh, invoiced by by Envoy. If you are familiar with Envoy filters, uh, most of the most of this logic uh, will be also familiar to you. You can see the ah, okay. I also <laughs> I also have it in the meantime. So you can see the actual endpoint IDs and uh, endpoint IPs, and you can see the uh, policy uh, per ingress in this case. If you run the next command, it's again Cilium Monitor, but here we are filtering for layer seven uh, communication. So we, uh, with this, uh, with this command, we will monitor the level uh, level uh, seven traffic. So if you go to the book info, because we expose this and hit a few refresh and go back to our terminal. We should see the flows. Yes, we, we have the flows here. Uh, to have the to have more detailed insights into into this level, uh, layer seven communication, you can also uh, annotate your pods uh, to to have these detailed uh, insights into. So let's use the next command, and that will, as you can see, it will uh, uh, increase the visibility for your Cilium proxy on this particular path and, uh, and port. So if you apply it, and if you refresh book info, what, you, what should be different in this case that is that you should have, where was my command? You should have uh, events for the details. Uh, from the DTS service as well. Let me quickly refresh this. Okay, it might have been broken, but if I use this, okay, now refresh. And if you look into it, you should see that we have the actual request uh, forwarded to these uh, details and this port, so it's uh, actually working. And I think basically that was all the workshop that we have for you today. We can uh, quickly jump back to the presentation for a few final slides. We talked about network policies, how the, how the default policy enforcement model is 
uh, all communication are logged by default and if you have a single uh, ingress rule then uh, it will be de uh, the it will be denied by default so it's basically a low listing uh, your connections which is which can add a nice layer uh, to your security posture and these are taken from the upstream film documentations uh, this can show how the local communication and the egress communication is working. You can explore these uh, at your own convenience uh, via the uh, upstream uh, documentation. And at the end, a few words about Solo. Basically, we will have the 2.1 uh, GlueMesh uh, version uh, coming out soon. And uh, basically, originally we had the Glue Gateway, the Glue Mesh, uh, but now we have this Glue Network which uh, basically can uh, control and contain Cilium as a CNI, so we can have the whole stack together. And we also uh, have support for uh, GraphQL uh, specific use cases, but basically this is uh, a nice flow to manage uh, the whole uh, life cycle of, of all of your uh, networking components. The goal of Glue Network is basically to have defense in depth, uh, we, uh, we uh, have support for Cilium and other CNIs, so we can have security and metrics on uh, different uh, layers to provide a better uh, way of uh, operating reliability, reliably and, uh, and uh, efficiently your applications. Uh, our UI will also include the Cilium specific details, so we can see that our Glue platform can discover your CNI that's running in your cluster, and we, uh, we can also uh, uh, manage its life cycle. So you can actually migrate from uh, a different CNI to, to Cilium, let's say, for example, to have uh, all of these components uh, in your cluster. So thank you for joining this session and uh, let me uh, show you this link because we have the academy.solo.io. We really like doing workshops. We have many uh, open source uh, solutions that we are introducing through, uh, through uh, workshops. Some of these are uh, instructor led and some of these are uh, on demand and you can basically execute uh, them at, at your own place. For example, we have the new ambient mesh uh, uh, workshop there. We have the Cilium uh, workshop. We have an eBPF getting started uh, workshop. We will have another one pretty soon. And we also have an Envoy uh, workshop. So make sure to uh, check these out and uh, feel free to join our community Slack channel and uh, ask questions about our uh, about the technologies we are working with and the products that we have. So thank you again for joining uh, me today.